thanks. I, uh, I, I'm happy to speak here, and I'll speak uh, every, uh, every few months or something if you want me to. I mean, uh, <laughs> well, but, uh, I'll speak at seven if you want to come back. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I say that now, but after next talk and all that, who knows. But um, no, this is really a great pleasure and uh, a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I got interested in plastics in the ocean as soon as I started my position at Woods Hole Oceanographic. Um, I was at a, a, a kid's uh, birthday party. A uh, friend, my, so my daughter had the same exact same birthday uh, date as uh, her little friend. Uh, and they, uh, we had a joint birthday party. And I got talking to the dad. Uh, uh, his name is Bjora Proskurowski. And he, at the time, was at the Sea Education Association group there. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm heading out in a few weeks, and uh, we're going to uh, collect some plastics for, uh, for study. And I said, whoa, you know, have you ever looked at these for microbial uh, interactions? Like, what kind of microbes are living on those? Um, and he said, no. And so we, we got together, and, and I threw a kit together so they could sample things. So I'll talk a bit about that. And what we found was just uh, astounding. So... Uh, that's how I got started in this. It all started with a, a, a kid's uh, birthday party. Um, and uh, here, here we go. Um, this is just a scheme that I'll refer to every now and then uh, from a review article that I, uh, I wrote a couple years ago. And uh, basically, uh, the idea here, there's a lot of unknowns about plastics. Um, we know that a majority of plastics now uh, get out to sea from uh, shore, uh, shoreline and uh, plastic that's escaping the waste stream. And when that heads out, it uh, can swiftly move on currents. For example, off of Cape Cod, um, it only takes less than a, 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 about a month or about a month to six weeks or so for the currents to swiftly carry that plastic out into the center of the uh, the. Atlantic, North Atlantic Subtropical Gyre, so it's called, uh, just off the, off the coast of, of Bermuda there, and be in a, like a, in a whirlpool fashion out there for decades. It's bordered by currents, it floats, it just sits there, and in the bright sun just photodegrades. But very, and so we know quite a bit about how much plastic's there uh, and uh, and the, as it's measured and with each net tow and every survey that's done in the Pacific and in Atlantic, so forth, um, we don't know uh, what happens to plastic below the very uh, top meter of the ocean there. And so what, uh, what my group has set out to do is first understand how microbes are interacting with plastic, and second, understand the ocean's deeper than one meter, and so we want to take a look at how plastic is moving through the water column and does, when does it ultimately. We know uh, some other groups have, have looked at the seafloor and found bits of plastic on the seafloor as well, even at 4,000, 5,000 meters deep. So this stuff's sinking, but at what rate? And there's a curious anomaly here, too. As much as we survey the surface of the oceans, it doesn't match up, the numbers don't match up with what we know is going into the ocean. So let's get started here. Uh, first off, wh why do we even care about this, right? What's the big deal? And so uh, according to uh, the Ocean Health Index, uh, some of the top threats are, pla are caused by plastics. And this is uh, entanglement of birds. And we've all seen the pictures and turtles and so forth. Um, but uh, also plastics can absorb and hold on to persistent, persistent organic pollutants. These are greasy uh, types of pollutants such as PCBs, right? And these things stick to plastics like uh, uh, the grease in a spaghetti sauce after microwaving, right? You see that red stuff covering, you know, it's hard to get off of there. Same deal. It's called sorption. And plastics are also known to act as rafts for uh, invasive species and can transport Harmful algal blooms, for example, to from one place to another where they never existed before. Other unknown system effects as well that we're starting to get into as far as when plastics get smaller and smaller and smaller. Down to 
uh, uh, these micron ranges and submicron ranges, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Let's start with the history of it here. It all started with uh, this wonderful uh, material that we started making uh, kids' toys and plastic cups and all kinds of consumer items, and this stuff escaped, right? We didn't have a good plan in place to recycle or to deal with this stuff, and it got into the ocean. And the very first uh, account of this uh, that I know of is from 1972 in uh, the publication Science, and uh, from Ed Carpenter and Ken Smith, they're both uh, big names in biological oceanography, who were at one, at one time, at this time, they were at Woods Hole Oceanographic. And they detailed in great uh, uh, specificity uh, in the Sargasso Sea, so this is the area that I was speaking of in the North Atlantic, uh, uh, subtropical gyre. Um, pieces that are brittle and, uh, and plastic that was, in, and they found 3,500 pieces in these net toes and uh, characterized things very well. They even characterized microbial uh, interactions such as biofilms and suspected that the microbes may be involved in the uh, biotransformations of these plastics. So way, way ahead of its time. Uh, an anonymous uh, uh, report in Marine Pollution Bulletin showed that uh, plastic cups were being consumed by uh, by uh, uh, Pollock and, or, and, and other, uh, other fish. Much like uh, the plastic moved, uh, much like a, 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 a fishing lure might fool a fish, right? And so these fish were just eating this stuff up and then their guts were full of plastic and they were perishing because of this. Uh, and it's because people at the time on these uh, ferries and so forth were drinking drinks from styrofoam cups and just throwing them in the water. Um, and that's, that practice has since stopped. And is, uh, as early as 1974, think about this, there was a, a four-step guideline here proposed by scientists, uh, Rhode Island Fisheries, and uh, as well, one of the authors is from Raytheon, right? Um, and, uh, and they came up with a, a four-step uh, way to deal with the problem of plastics in the ocean. 1974, this is a while ago, right? So develop water-soluble, photodegradable polymers for one-time use, and develop non-polluting incinerators and ways to deal with the waste, and better efforts in, in plastic recycling as well, and, uh, and technology development and reclamation centers. I am uh, sad to report that we're still stuck in this uh, cycle right here trying to deal with the plastic. But I won't bum you all out at the very end. There's a, it gets better. So, um, so where does it come from, and and why haven't we done anything about this? Well, we, we have, right? It used to be the Marpole uh, before the Marpole Treaty in the 80s here um, that uh, it wasn't illegal to to dump plastic. You just threw it off your boat, and that was that, right? But that changed uh, even in international waters. Uh, it's illegal to dump plastics. It can only be uh, food and, and other waste. Um, and that was in 1988 when this was passed. And yet, we still have increasing plastic uh, being put into uh, the system. And in fact, a uh, seminal paper in 2015 from Jenna Jambeck and collaborators uh, showed that uh, that up to, on average, about 8 million metric tons of plastic enter the ocean uh, annually, right? Um, that's like uh, 8 million uh, Volkswagens uh, being, dumped into the, being dumped into the ocean uh, every year of plastic. They modeled this stuff and, uh, and, and suspected that, and it's also been hypothesized by uh, the McKinsey report as well, that uh, there's about 150 million tons based on these numbers and the accumulation of it over the time, uh, that 150 million tons of plastic have entered uh, the ocean so far. That's a lot of plastic. Um, these are some of the sources of marine debris. Where's it coming from, right? And it's not, it's not really from marine dumping, uh, but there are disasters at sea that occur. But uh, beaches, river waterways, uh, drainage outflows. It's the LA River, you know, they get 
uh, periodic rains, and they just set up a simple boom here to be able to catch some of this debris. But uh, yeah, lost cargo, um, derelict fishing gear is a, is a big one as well uh, for threats to, uh, to marine life. Catastrophic event, events as well, such as a tsunami, uh, uh, debris, and so forth. Um, big pulses. But uh, I'm not going to get uh, um, too down on plastic because it's of immense utility. Imagine uh, trying to fly in a, 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 a big passenger airplane made out of bamboo, right? That's not going to happen. And so plastic is an amazing material, and, uh, but it, I think we've become complacent in our use of plastic. And, uh, and how wonderful it is, and, uh, and that there's this endless supply of it. Um, what some of the, uh, what's been a very effective now to be able to control plastic is to barcode bottles. It's been done in Norway with great success. Over 98% of bottles that were barcoded were returned for recycling. And, uh, and the uh, people in the industry call this keeping the molecule in play. And so it's a great way to be able to keep plastic Keep it recycling. Keep it uh, within the uh, with, within the consumer stream, and keep changing it, upcycling it, and uh, and as it said, keep that molecule in play. Thirty-two percent of packaging escapes collection systems, uh, and is ultimately released into the environment. That's a huge uh, huge part of uh, the sources of plastic. There's uh, the main types of plastic here. The types above these lines here. Uh, float. We've got low density and high density polyethylene and polypropylene. These are the main things that we find uh, when we're looking in the ocean. And there's polystyrene. Now, if it's not foamed, of course, it's, if it's foamed, it floats. Um, but it also degrades pretty quickly in the sunlight, too, uh, month-long uh, month time scales. But polystyrene, uh, if it's not foamed, sinks, as well as PVC, uh, polyvinyl chloride, and uh, polyethylene terephthalate, it's what a, a water bottle is made out of, or a, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a polyester, and so that's what fleece jackets and stuff are made out of. Now, uh, I don't know who's heard of this uh, plastics uh, garbage patch in the North Pacific here. Um, when I first heard of it, this is what I thought. I thought it was this place that you could, uh, you know, start thinking about building condos on and things like that. <laughs> but it's not. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's much more subtle than that, and you wouldn't even see it if the, if the wind was really blowing hard because of wind mixing. But you drag a net through, and you see this confetti-type stuff. On the average, it's about five to eight millimeters. And that's just what we can see with a net toe. This, uh, the pore size on this, on this net is about uh, 330 micron, so about a third of a, of a millimeter. Um, and that's what uh, typically a, a, a typical survey with a net toe would, would yield. This is what, uh, what you're getting and how this is done when you do a net toe. This is the, uh, my colleagues at the Sea Education Association. It's pretty cool. Uh, for any students out here, I uh, highly recommend it. It's, uh, you can apply for it in your uh, junior or senior year of college and spend an entire semester out at sea uh, doing science and uh, working with really great people. Um, and they go all over the world, not just the, <clears throat> the Sargasso Sea now. Uh, they're, they're in New Zealand and Europe and so forth. Um, but they started with these net toes uh, and had been doing these the same way since the early 1970s. Um, and it's a uh, mouth here of a, of, that drops down to a meter and, uh, and is towed through the water at, uh, at two knots and filters, on average, about 480,000 liters of seawater. And then, as a student, you'll be lucky enough to be able to pick through the plastics afterwards. So. But no, it's, it's really a, a, a great thing. Highly recommend it. There's some more processing. Um, so, uh, so some people at SEA, uh, in particular Sky Moret, um, uh, started processing these data that were collected since the early 1970s and compiled this. And you can see here as a heat map here, uh, these are upwards of 60,000 pieces per square kilometer um, all the way down to zero. 
uh, here in the pink. And so you see these warmer colors in the centers of those gyres, just emphasizing that collection in the center of that giant whirlpool. We have five of these on our planet, five gyres. And there's uh, the, uh, the Indian Ocean around the back here, and then the uh, North and South Pacific, and the North and South Atlantic. So where's the plastic? Um, from the best uh, uh, net-tow surveys, we're only seeing about 250,000 uh, metric tons. And a new update here in the, in the Pacific Garbage Patch, it just came out this year, uh, is that plastic's rapidly accumulating, but it's at 129,000 metric tons just in the North Pacific subtropical gyre. But we're dealing with, overall, what's being put into the system, what's being put into the ocean, is 150 million metric tons over that time. That, that stuff should still be there. If it's not going anywhere and it's floating, it should all be there, right? We should be seeing that. Why aren't we seeing it? Where is it? And it's, be, it's, it's, not, it's not a silly question. This is something that we, uh, people have been trying to wrap their heads around. Where is it going? We don't see it. So now's my segue into microbiology. I'm a microbiologist uh, um, uh, by training, and it's, it's where uh, a big part of my interests lie. And so I'm going to talk about uh, microbial interactions with plastics and how they have the potential to biotransform plastics in the ocean. But first, let's just start off with the, the basics here. Uh, in the ocean, there's about a million cells per milliliter in the open ocean, clear blue water, right? Um, and as you go down uh, to 1,000, 4,000 meters or so, that, that those numbers drop a bit. You get down to uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the tens of thousands of, uh, of cells per mil. But the, this rule holds is that there's always about 10 viruses for each uh, cell that's there. And if you add all this up, um, there's 10 to the 29th microbes in the world's oceans. That's a lot. I mean, I, I can't even uh, wrap my head around that. It's more stars, though, than are in the universe. So, um, so there's a lot of microbes there, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of diversity of microbes, too. Most diverse uh, life on our planet. And so, uh, so when my friend Yora and I um, wanted to look at microbes, on plastics, we were betting on biodiversity here. We're like, I bet microbes are doing something interesting with this plastic. They're not just sitting on it, right? Not just hanging out, but I bet they're eating it. You know, I bet something's going on. And uh, in the very first samples that we prepped and looked at um, on a weekend uh, blew us across the room. Basically, what we found were these beds of these cells here that were, uh, were digging, etching into the plastic. It looked like they were eating this stuff. And so I'm going to take you on a, on a trip here, right? Right now, uh, this is at 31x magnification. This is electron microscopy, so we got an exquisite magnification and a really cool like depth of field, too. Everything's in focus, right? From the top of the sample all the way down to the base of the of the, the pedestal that it's sitting on here. That's what those cracks are. That's this adhesive stuff. I put this uh, plastic pellet on. And it's like a nurdle, what they call it. It's a, it's a chunk of plastic for manufacturing. Um, and uh, and this, keep your eye on this red circled part here. Um, gonna, we're going we're gonna to go on a, on a trip here. And so we're moving in here right now. We're at about 100x. And you can see there's uh, there's you know, some texture there. What is that? And we're about 200x now. It's starting to look like something's going on. What is that? Oh, man, check that out, you know? Look at this. We're almost at 1,000x here. And you can just see how many of these microbes are here. And what's uh, pretty surprising is you see some of these are dividing, OK? And microbes divide, slow ones divide one per day, right? And so and there's a whole, whole beds of these things here. These things have colonized this plastic in the open ocean and are growing all over it. There's a, even a, more of a better picture here, over 1,000x. But when we took a sample of these cells here, um, because we were wanting to amplify the genomes and do some sequencing, see who they were, we're still trying to uh, get the methods down here to work this out. But um, 
this stuff just uh, with a scalpel just was like dust. It was, uh, it was very oxidized and very degraded. Uh, now, okay, so it's not, uh, it's not unheard of. There's, uh, there's bacteria that have been found to eat polyesters and other things. There was a nice paper in, in Science just a few years ago, uh, and microbes that could degrade polyester. Uh, bottles like water bottles and stuff. But <clears throat> this is under uh, high nutrient conditions in a landfill type of setting, um, and in a bioreactor type of setting. We're talking out in the open ocean you know, in very low nutrient conditions. So that was surprising for us. Um, so, uh, so it seems that plastics are uh, being perforated and made smaller and somewhat digested, or let's say biotransformed, by, uh, by microbial life. I want to say, too, that that's just not a, that sample I showed you isn't just one thing that we found. Uh, about 40% of everything, uh, and these are hundreds of samples that we've looked at from various regions, not just the Pacific, but also the Atlantic as well, um, about 40% have notable uh, amounts of those uh, hydrolyzing uh, types of activities, and those cells are present, those uh, what we call cocci, little round guys that are growing. Um, and, uh, and so let us uh, down another path, too, once we started once the paper of Jambeck et al. came out in 2015, started wondering, where is the plastic going? How can, uh, how can my group contribute to that understanding? Uh, and so uh, postdoc, uh, Xie Zhao, who's, uh, who's come from Woods Hole uh, with me here to, uh, to Harbor Branch, um, is, uh, uh, was the lead on this study and uh, did some really great work together with our collaborators at University of Connecticut, Ed, uh, uh, Evan Ward, and uh, his assistant, Megan Dow Danley. Um, and, uh, and so we've, uh, um, uh, we collected seawater. And I should explain about uh, marine aggregates. So in our ocean, the number one uh, form of carbon and pieces of stuff that are in there is called marine snow. And this is the basis of the uh, of the, 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 of the food chain, basically. And every other like filter feeding type of thing filters this carbon. And it has bacteria. It has exudates from other things that grew and entangled and, and, and are ensnared in this stuff. And they're, uh, they're small. They're about 100 microns or uh, up to a millimeter in size. Um, and, uh, and so we thought, I bet these small pieces of plastic, once they start to dissolve and get degraded up in the upper layers of the ocean, start to get ensnared and entangled in marine snow. And so we set out an experiment to show that. But first, we had to develop a technique. And that's what this paper was here. And we used a fancy type of uh, spectroscopy here called uh, Raman spectroscopy. And we were looking at really small stuff. So we had to have a microscope as well to guide the laser to do that. I'll explain a bit about that. First, though, we collected these particles. You have to use a special kind of, of pumping to get them into a cone, a settling cone, and then let them settle down in. And then we took these, and we uh, uh, put them down on, uh, on a calcium fluoride disk. This is just so uh, our spectroscopy uh, method doesn't, it, it doesn't interfere with it at all. And so we can focus the laser onto the actual pieces that are there. And we found pieces of plastic that look like this. These are about 100 microns in length. And we get, with Raman spectroscopy, it's sort of like uh, hitting uh, something with a mallet, and you get a characteristic tone back. It's the same when you hit uh, uh, this piece of plastic with a laser, and you get back. You're listening to that tone that comes back. And that's what this, uh, this signal is back here. Uh, it's, it's got different absorbances, and that's telling you about the molecules that are vibrating, what kinds of molecules are there. You can take that, that fingerprint, and you can match it up to a database and identify plastics with, uh, with great, uh, great success. And so uh, we found a couple things. We found a clear signal of plastics there, less than 300 microns in these ag uh, of size in these aggregates. And we also found that the plastics were jagged and sharp, uh, and not just smooth little pellets and little bits. So 
And this is kind of what they look like. They're kind of twisted and, and so forth. Um, the one uh, uh, paper had suspected, this is in uh, proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences, in 2014 had suspected that uh, from their measurements, they actually tried to measure smaller stuff in the upper ocean, but they didn't see near as much as they should, or they thought they should from modeling. And it makes sense. When you take something and you break it up into little bits, you get more of those pieces, right? Um, but they were seeing less of the small stuff and more of the bigger stuff. And things that were about 300 micron or so in size were characteristically missing. And the stuff that we're finding and only finding are about 300 microns in size. So we felt like, hmm, maybe we've got something here. Maybe, maybe we're seeing some of the missing plastic. So we followed up that story with another one that just came out uh, a couple of months ago in environmental science and technology. Again, she is uh, the lead here and my same collaborators from Yukon. Um, and uh, we found that over 90% of the plastic aggregate particles were smaller than a millimeter. And 40% uh, and of these plastics were, so, okay, so, and then we also added this in, we were seeing, well, let's complete the cycle here. Let's look at, the, at mussels. We know mussels uh, do a lot of filtering. In fact, one mussel will filter 40 liters of water per day. We wanted to see, if these things take up plastic and does it get into their digestive system, does it stay? What, what happens, right? We found that uh, almost half of the microplastics were consumed by the, uh, uh, that were in marine snows, were uh, consumed by mussels and were either rejected, but rejected at the spot, at the point where they make these things called pseudofeces, so these little pellets that are sent out saying, oh, I don't want that or as actual passing through the entire digestive tract um, and, and deposited as feces. And these things settle uh, if they're, uh, they're up in the water column or they're, they're on, a, on, a, on a pier piling, for example. These pellets sink pretty quick and could be a rapid way for plastics to be deposited down to uh, the bottom uh, benthic layer. And we found all kinds of different plastics there. Uh, it was surprising to us just how hard uh, it was to identify a lot of this stuff. We had to get a better database. We had to calibrate it. We had to develop some software. Um, and we're finding you know, in industrial dyes. Sometimes that was the only thing that we could identify with our, uh, with our technique. Um, and, but we see PVC, we see different types of glues, and cellulose acetate, most likely from cigarette butts, um, but uh, a whole diversity of stuff there. Um, this was um, in, in from a, a, a sample of off Avery Point, and so it's uh, you know very quaint, a uh, little um, uh, harbor town, and it looks pristine and very clean. But uh, really, there's there's also a lot of uh, uh, a lot of small plastics and stuff there in the water. Um, we looked at and we found uh, over 85, well, 85 microplastic pieces were confirmed by spectrometry uh, analysis. And a, a remarkable thing I just want to show, too, is that these, the size of plastics that were in the marine snow particles were identical or really matched the size that were captured by the mussels. So it's a perfect fit, right? It's a perfect match. You've got uh, plastics that are just this certain size, and the mussels consume that and, and capture those for feeding. The upshot and uh, the, the, uh, the good news about this is that when we depurated the, the mussels, as you would uh, if you were uh, harvesting these to eat or for commercial purposes or something, you put them into clean water, um, we found that all the plastic was egested and, and um, and not maintained in the muscles. Uh, let me tell you about some pilot data here for this, uh, this filtration study that we've, that we've done. This, uh, these are high volume pumps that can pump about up to 10,000 liters. Uh, and we had these out on an array and we're able to get down to about 1,000 meters or so um, and this is from a collaboration and some samples of opportunity that we had from a study uh, from, from uh, some colleagues that uh, were out off the, off the coast of uh, between Japan and the Aleutian Islands here at a so-called station called this K2. 
And station K2 is a very productive upwelling region, very dense with uh, diatoms and, and other primary productive uh, types of organisms. Uh, cold waters, of course, um, and uh, very nutrient rich. And uh, one of the things that we found on our uh, filters was that uh, so all the way down to 1,000 meters, every single sample contained plastic. And these pieces of plastic were very small. They were, uh, the stuff in red here is 150 micron or smaller, and it made up over half of the samples that we found. And we also found that uh, the abundances of these small pieces of plastic um, were uh, either rivaled the amounts of plastic that are found in the Pacific Garbage Patch or, uh, or were higher. And so there's a lot of this stuff. It's very small um, and, uh, and it's of diverse nature. Um, but mainly we found big parts of, it, of this stuff were polypropylene uh, of all things. There's more, a little more polypropylene than the polyethylenes. Um, and uh, small stuff that's 150 micron or smaller <clears throat> um, can uh, cross, is known to be able to cross the epithelial lining of, uh, of the gut tract in humans and, uh, and get, uh, and get um, into so-called Peyer's patch uh, regions of the, of the human intestine and could pose a, a human health threat. This is the, uh, again, these are pilot data but uh, we have more, uh, more studies going on right now and more samples being gathered in the uh, South Atlantic as I speak, actually. And our very own Indian River Lagoon has just been a sort of paper. It just came out a couple of months ago from a, a group at the University of Central Florida. And uh, it was found that, uh, uh, that numbers um, were higher in, in vertebrates uh, for microplastics than, uh, than any other uh, study ever reported. So they were looking at, uh, at these, uh, these crabs um, and, uh, uh, and oysters in the Mosquito Lagoon, so the upper Indian River Lagoon. So one thing we want to do uh, is study the uh, Indian River Lagoon, for example, and start to understand uh, the plastic. Uh, the plastics there and how they're moving through the food chain. Do they bioconcentrate up the, up the food chain? So let's sum this up a bit uh, and wrap this up. But uh, you can see here, uh, plastics are coming off the coast and, uh, and um, but they, one thing we think they might be doing is being, uh, being degraded by high energy wave action as well. That could be uh, something that's happening. And then microbes we think are involved too. This stuff's incorporating into uh, uh, marine snows and sinking and interacting with organisms uh, in ways that we never uh, thought were, were, uh, were possible. And in fact, uh, there's different density layers as to uh, as the ocean, uh, as you go through the ocean and different water bodies in the water column, and these concentrate into thin layers, and so plastics could be concentrated along there, and something uh, we're looking into with the samples that we're collecting right now in the South Atlantic. Some future goals here. I'd love to work with the instrument, uh, instrument development team and, and engineers here uh, that are fantastic at Harbor Branch and, uh, and develop some prototypes and, so, and the right software to be able to see plastics in the water column. Uh, it's a really tedious job, and you've got to work really carefully and wear all cotton and all this stuff and work in, a, in a, a filtered air environment to be able to work with this stuff just so we don't get contaminating plastics. Um, to be able to measure this stuff directly in the water uh, would be fantastic. And then, uh, you know, big ideas here, but to be able to optimize these sensors for deployment on ships of opportunity and field applications and moorings and stuff, so forth, like some of the illustrations, the stuff here. Um, and ultimately, create a census of plastic debris in the ocean. Where is it going, right? And how long does it last? And if we stop putting plastic in the ocean, how long will it take for the ocean to clear itself, right? It's the kind of things I want to know. Uh, so, you know, th this, uh, one of the most important things that's starting to come out here is it's so important to just keep plastic from getting into the watersheds and, and into, the, into the oceans and, and into our lakes. 
Uh, this is an ingenious little invention here called Mr. Trash Wheel. And Mr. Trash Wheel uh, also has uh, a sister, uh, um, and I think her name's Dr. Trash Wheel. And uh, she's in a different watershed, but this, these are in Baltimore. And uh, look at this. We've picked up 16 dumpsters, dumpsters of trash during a single rainstorm. And these aren't small dumpsters either. This is a big instrument. It's, these are these 20-foot-long dumpsters, you know, like you get on a construction site or something. And on the back, I um, wasn't able to get a picture of it, but you can sort of see the, uh, the solar panels on the back of it. That's what's driving the wheel here. So they have these booms, and they just have this simple little, you know, planetary uh, gear motor here that's, that's driving this belt. And, uh, and just gobbling up the trash. So it's ingenious ideas like this, and, I, and, and making it fun, too. You know, hey, put some googly eyes on it. Why not? Um, that we can do, I think, to, to, to really control this problem and, and take it on head on. I thank you all for your time, and I'll try to answer any questions you might have.